Good evening. So another dialogue between Professor Falola and Professor Uchi Modell. Curiel, so Professor Falolo Start is the PhD and professor of the University of Texas, Austin, and uh, professor of the at the University, uh, at the PhD University of IFE, uh, and has seven honorary PhDs and several awards during his career, president of the Scientific Committee at UNESCO, and currently. He is president of the Committee of the African Diaspora and uh, Committee of UNISA. Professor Falola will speak during 30 to 40 minutes, and then I'll, see, I'll yield the floor to Professor Uchikuya after introducing her, of course. Thank you all for this affection. Well, this affection is born out of the context of communities. Communities that have expressed their activism today in the last panel and yesterday that I don't read, I talk, so I'm not reading anything. That in the context of what we are doing, they've manifested a deep sense of community and they are talking from the heart, as you can see. There is an alliance between what they believe and what they practice. And in that kind of orientation, we are very grateful. The Yoruba called Brazil as a nickname. They gave it a nickname, Ilubiri. It translates the country of women. It is not exorcist label but it's a collective sign of affection in which they see beauty in you, all of you. They see beauty in individuals. They've constructed the notion of femininity drawing from Yemoja. And I'm here at the Lubiri, and this is my 17th time of coming to this country. This is my first time of coming to this city the 17th time of coming to Brazil. I've seen a colleague of mine, I've been to Rio. I live in Sao Paulo. Salvador is home. I contemplated buying an apartment there at some point. So I'm back home and thanks for welcoming me. The surprise is that you have never attempted to let me stay. You always ask me to go back. Maybe one day, you will just kidnap me <laughs> and I won't have to go back. Thank you. Let me depress you a little bit it's because by making you sad, I can make you happy at the end. And you know, if I've made you sad and you are not very happy, the trick is to get yourself a cup of water Put a lot of sugar in it and you drink it. And your stomach will be sweet. <laughs> and your happiness will return. And in making you sad, I want to make you sad on four points. The first one is the ceremony surrounding the burial of the late queen. And I wrote a piece that went viral the embarrassing nostalgia of the empire in which you are celebrating your tormentor. And you are celebrating a cast of ruthless empire builder. And black people, we don't get angry. That's part of our being. We don't get angry. And we don't revenge. There is no revenge in our blood. And African head of states, they went, forgetting that they were participating in the burial of their former tormentor. What happens? They put the president of America, they dignified him, he rode in his convoy. What did they do? All African presidents 
They put them in a bus. All of them. They put them in a bus. They were even looking for a driver, suggesting, asking them, does any of you know how to get to this place? He said, how can you put all of you in, in a bus? But it's a symbolism that we are speaking to, the hierarchies of power, and how these hierarchies of power get manifested in symbolic spaces, symbolic manifestation, even in clear acts of rudeness. Second, and you have been following it, attack on what is called critical theory. And I'm from Texas that regards itself as an autonomous republic. What they're saying is you can't teach slavery. They don't want you to teach race. They don't want you to teach the Atlantic slave trade. And that attack is very vigorous. If you have not been following this debate, please do, because it has to be a global fight. When you are saying, we don't want critical theory, a third way is the spread of destructive liberal economies tied to globalization. The imperialism of the 19th century is now the current globalization. Currencies have been devastated. Ghana, which used to be, do well, its currency has plunged so badly. Nigeria, so badly, in which this spread of destructive liberal economies, they are destroying further, intensifying the scale of poverty and mass producing more poor people. I listen to the activists on the rise of Lula, but the fight is just about to begin. So we cannot be tired of this fight. And my fourth source of the spread of um, making you sad is knowledge suppression, knowledge suppression. And that knowledge suppression, you see it in COVID. When it broke out, they said, in the case of Africa, you'll be picking dead bodies on the streets, that they're going to die. They didn't die. <laughs> in fact, one million Americans died. <laughs> How many people died in Africa? <laughs> they didn't die. They said the same thing of Ebola. Ebola will wipe them out. They said HIV will kill all of them. They didn't die. They didn't die. Rather, not only did they survive, they survived more. But that COVID, in spite of knowledge coming from Africa, profound knowledge for that matter, they ignored it. But what did people do? People began to protect themselves by going back to that knowledge of the 17th century, of the 18th century. The knowledge on COVID the fundamentals of it, all of them, in relation to Africa, is not true. First of all, they present the virus as new. No, Africa, since the Stone Age, has had viruses. Not only that, it developed virus cults. When I was born, 1952, 53, I was born into a virus called smallpox, Shapana, which you find in Brazilian Candoble pantheon of gods and goddesses. It was a virus of smallpox. We've always had viral cultures. The entire Southern African region, South Africa, that you call shamanism, they arose out of the cause of, of, of infection. And over time, they created elaborate knowledge on how to deal with related diseases, virus, viral, like COVID. They've been doing it for centuries. Otherwise, they wouldn't have survived. 
you will have died. Second, they said social distancing is new. No, it's not correct. It is not correct. Africans had mastered social distancing for centuries. And they said quarantine is new. That is not correct. That is how, for centuries, they've been dealing with leprosy, with epilepsy, with mental illness. Let me take the example of mental illness. There's no royal family with a single case of mental illness. What did they do? At the very sign of it, they will ship you to another kingdom. At the very sign of leprosy, they will quarantine you. At the very sign of a virus disease, they will create their own social distancing. And they say you are taking vaccination. And the Bill Gates Foundation said Africans are not used to vaccination. That is absolute nonsense. We call it incision. That's what we call it. On my head, on my chest, I took many incisions in which you take a blade or a knife, you make the cut, and you put the medicine. That's, that's, that's what you call vaccination. How you get medicine into the bloodstream very quickly. My mother did it for me. My parents did incision for me. We've always been doing incision. And those of you who study military warfare, how do we use spears and arrows? In European military, you, you, you do physical contact combat. In Africa, those arrows, those spears, those knives, we kill lion and tiger. We don't go to the lion direct because we put poison on the head of the arrow. We use those instruments to deliver the poison, not to cut into pieces. So they, they, for centuries, they knew how to deliver medication into your body's blood, blood system. But once you kill that knowledge, then you are killing other things. And part of what conferences like do is about knowledge recovery. So when you accumulate my depressive starting point, you find issues around coloniality, which I've been talking about, post-coloniality, which remain, and an hierarchical world, which I explain through the barrier of the queen. My task, which I've been asked to do, was to talk about the coloniality of being, the coloniality of knowledge, the coloniality of power, and the coloniality of nature. Moderator, that is what they ask us to do. I will do all of them in brief. And I send the paper ahead of time, and the organizer can release the paper to whoever is interested. And the reason why I sent it ahead of time is to make the job of the translator much easier because there are just too many concepts in the paper. I want to start with the coloniality of being, and I will make five points. First point, epistemic marginality, in which as a people, as a community, as a group, as a race, as an ethnicity, irrespective of how you look at it, you find our marginality being expressed, being articulated, and being converted into politics and practices. Some of you yesterday and today spoke to the idea of that marginality. Second point, the concept of dishonored self and dishonored body, which some of you spoke to, if you don't honor someone's body, and if you don't honor the self as external manifestations of relationship, suppose the person does not honor the self, the person himself or herself. That's an epistemic suicide. And suppose the person dishonor his or her own body. That's an epistemic suicide. Remember MCCA, 
they put Senghor and the Negritude movement. Part of what they were articulating is to say, Nascimento, the guru here, why don't you respect yourself? Why don't you create a being? Why don't you start with yourself? And my latest book, published by the University of Cambridge Press, Autoethnography and Knowledge System. It's a very long book, so it's just one month old in the market. Africanizing knowledge, autoethnography and knowledge system. I just wrote a methodology book just about myself. I wrote 500 pages about myself. It's not the first time I will write about myself. My first memoir by the University of Michigan Press, A Mouth Sweeter Than Salt, documented my life up until the age of 12. And then I did a second volume, also University of Michigan Press, Counting the Tiger's Teeth which carried my story to my teenager years. But those are memoirs. The current book is called an autoethnography. Yesterday, one of the speakers talked about the self. The self is an archive. It's an archive. And as I argued in that Cambridge book, that I don't need the colonial archive to talk about my people. If I have it, all well and good. But I don't need that archive. Because that archive has been distorted, it's been manipulated, and is structured around an epistemology of control. When I took myself, and years ago I did an essay, which I also presented in Brazil, Ritual Archives, arguing that if you go to a Candomblé house, or any house, or a Liaye in Bahia, which I've gone many times, and you, that's an archive. It's an archive. In the Western Academy, they label it, they will say religion. That's not how we label. That's not how we label. It's they who use the Western Academic framework to label for us. And I began to write various chapters, breaking myself into components of chapters, including my clothes. This cloth I'm wearing is handmade. I designed it. It's an archive. There's a story. I don't wear any clothes that doesn't have a story. So yourself embodies an archive. not just in his physical essence, which we can see, but in his mentality, which we cannot see. That mentality is an epistemology. What we see is an artifact. What you do, what you use that mentality to do is an ontology. So if I talk to you for one hour, I, be, I can begin a process of writing about you and your being and your essence and your representation. And part of what I've done in that book is that as more and more and more of you begin to turn the self into an archive, and as you begin to do that, not only are we going to have a recovery process, we are going to have an intellectual renaissance. We are going to have limitless data, autoethnographies, stories that are never represented in any book. And fortunately, the field has been recognized. In that coloniality of being, my third point is what I call the disalienation of thought and bodies. That if you do not recover your bodies and yourself, it will become an alien in two ways. An alien to yourself, in which you as a self is an alien of yourself. You are a stranger to yourself. You are a stranger to yourself if you don't take your history seriously. You are a stranger to yourself if you don't take your culture seriously. You are a stranger to yourself 
if you some people, if you are not, I don't want to use a word that the trans, I'm careful using words that the translator can, can use. So I'm trying to reduce the jargons. You can, a self can become an alien of the self, a stranger of yourself, in your thought processes, in the articulation of self, in your representation. You can actually hate yourself. Yeah, you may not know. You may not know. For instance, suppose you accept a, an imposed definition of aesthetics on yourself. Suppose they define beauty for you and you accept it. You have become a stranger to yourself. You begin to resent yourself. You begin to go to the mirror and say, am I beautiful? Posing that question itself is problematic because you are also destroying yourself. But the critical one is this alienation of the external in which the external person is misrepresenting you and destroying you in the process. Defining the food for you, defining the fashion for you, defining the language for you. And the, the most powerful, the most dangerous tool are two things. Definition and label. If, if you accept the definition of yourself, of your people, of your nation, of your community by others, a power has been imposed upon you. And it's a tremendous amount of power. And if you allow others to label you, you have been destroyed. If you ask me, for example, dark continent, 19th century label, a continent without history, that's a definition. That's a label. Your car breaks down. You want to jumpstart it. Negative is black. That's a label. Angels are white. The Satan is black. Why will you accept that definition? Why will you accept to be labeled that way? Because that's a process of disalienation. The fourth point in terms of coloniality of being is what I call, um, I don't know whether the translator can do, can translate it, the mass sterilization of the mind. The sterilization of the mind is a, is a medical label in which your mind becomes sterilized. Like putting your minds in the mortuary. And the fifth point is the adoption large scale of foreign values. Is adoption. And we see in the case of Africa, the impact of Islam, the impact of Christianity linked into changing those worldviews, creating mass sterilization. And I will give you just one example. Yes, when I was young, when I was in school, I was very lucky in the 1950s. It was a, an age of cultural revival. That was when Achebe published Things Fall Apart. Everybody was very happy. And secondary schools in the region where I came from, they were doing competitions in drama. They were doing competition in music. They were doing competition in everything. And I represented my school in reading Yoruba language. By the time I was 10, I wrote my first play on the streets in Ibadan, similar to some aspects in Bahia. You were performing every day. You were performing on the streets every day. Today, if you, if you go back to this same location and you write a play, getting people to act in it is very difficult because they have been disconnected. In my days when I was young, within two days, you can, you can bring together actors and performers because that's what we are doing on the streets all the time, honing our language skills, the use of proverbs, the use of idioms. On a daily basis, we are expanding on them. 
And as we began to lose them, I said, okay, let us revive them. And I went to a governor. Governors in Nigeria are very powerful. The governor is dead now. He said, your excellency, let us revive this. And we set up a committee and wanted to revive it. And then, before we announced it, somebody said, we have to go and get the permission of the head of the Pentecostal church, the redeemed church of Christ. So what? And they said, if you don't get this permission, the entire effort will be sabotaged. What happened is that in most parts of Africa, they now confuse religion with cultures. They don't make the separation. Whereas traditionally, our people have made that tradition. And it's very clear cut that you can separate cultures from religion where possible. But the Pentecostals lumped everything. Culture, religion, they are the same. There are food of Orisha, you cannot eat it. Clothes of Orisha, you cannot wear them. Music of Orisha, you cannot play them in this Pentecostal onslaught. And we reach a serious problem. Let me turn to the coloniality of knowledge. Five quick points. Education, instruments of subjectivation. It's an instrument. The miseducation of black people is everywhere, including Brazil, and um, the big initiative to teach African history, the big initiative to teach diaspora history. We have to commend them. Second, what I call the laboratories of internalized colonialism. In that laboratories of internalized colonialism, a generation has been trained to repulse, repel, abandon indigenous epistemologies. They've been trained to abandon them. Massive destruction. I advocated two ideas that why do we have to accept the Western definition of the disciplines in our universities. Why do we have to? And I propose, why don't you give a degree in witchcraft, which two universities are now doing in South Africa? I was part of the team that defined this four-year syllabus. You can now have a degree in witchcraft. We need some witches in this room. It's a degree, it's a body of knowledge, it's a thought system. Then, when the Alafi of Foyoton 80, I was a keynote speaker, and I said, why, why don't you create a degree around kingship? We've been having kings before Christ. It's a well-developed, why don't you say, you are giving masters in what? In kingship. Why must you say you are giving BA in history? Why don't you say BA kingship? The knowledge is so rich, it's extensive. In four years, you cannot complete it. And then I made the point. Why don't you create a degree in divination, in Ifa? Why call it anthropology? You may. But you can also say, I have a department of IFA. <laughs> Why? You cannot exhaust the knowledge. What, what do we do in the humanities? Critical thinking. Elaborate connection of one literature to another. We have alternative knowledge systems that can be elevated to degrees. What do we do? We throw all of them away. It's not late. It is not late. It's not late. And I'm on the council of three universities. And I'm saying, 
Let's rethink the disciplines. Let's rethink them. Far more beyond labels. Let's begin to award degrees that are based on our own cumulated knowledge of centuries. The pharaohs, by the 15th century, the ideas of the monarchy was in, 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 in Africa. Shaka Zulu created the first military nationalism in world history. You can't have a degree in war without, under, without studying Shaka Zulu. Why do we now turn what we have into appendages instead of centralizing them into disciplines and we use them to flourish? And in this chronology of knowledge, my, first, my last point is what I call cognitive re-engineering. Cognitive re-engineering is very dangerous because what it does is not only to attack your disciplines, it attacks your ideas on causation, which is the pre one of the things we do in which the epistemologies of understanding reality, you begin over time to become disconnected with them. I have a forthcoming book from Ohio University Press on metaphysics. I began to accumulate the Yoruba metaphysics. And I said, this is a body of knowledge with its own cognitive integrity. What you call superstition is cognitive knowledge. You, you, you engineer it to work for you. You just don't take this wide body of knowledge. And I begin to give examples on time, on space, location, in which there are preeminent understanding. If somebody dies, God forbid, at what age? You will say 70. Metaphysics will ask you, what are you counting? So you count from the day he's born, in your own dictionary, to the time he's dead. Why don't you include the time he was in the mother's womb and had it to the age? Why don't you include the time he has not been conceived and you had it to the age? Why don't you include the afterlife in which he becomes an ancestor and he comes back as a masquerade? He keeps coming back as a masquerade. It's a, it's a way of thinking. But if you take the Western calendar, his life is 80 years. No. No. If you say good morning, what is good morning? Good morning is not 8 o'clock. Good morning is when you wake up. If you wake up at 3 p.m., that's your good morning. And if somebody says you are not successful, yes, under what calendar are you not successful? At the age of 35, maybe you are going to succeed at 82. You can be successful at 82. <laughs> and, and, and those reordering of those metaphysics, we have to do. Um, I don't want the moderator to stop me. Coloniality of power, quickly one point that we have to reconfigure the economic system, coloniality of gender, that the we have to study our people more carefully because the terminologies we are using to study them are very misleading. Because we, we took the patriarchy of coloniality, the patriarchy of Christianity, and we use them to study the 15th century, 16th century. No, it's very misleading. Very, very misleading. I grew up in the compound. Nobody told you that a, you, a, you are superior to a woman. Nobody will have told anybody. Nobody will have told that anybody that. Nobody will have told any man who is 50 that is superior to a 60-year-old woman. That is colonial knowledge. Because we use age, we use genealogy, we use knowledge systems, we use the ability to sing, to tell stories, to define our own boundaries. So that the matrix we are using sometimes is extremely misleading. And when they make statements, Africans are polygamous, this is the way they treat women. People do not remember that 
you are dealing with the traditions affected by the transatlantic slave trade. That's what you are studying. You are studying the remnants of the transatlantic slave trade. That's what you are studying. And I've been taking all these pieces one by one and demolishing them. How many people have money to marry three wives? People do not know that if you are a teenager, if you are about to get married, your father had a complicated option. Should you use the money to marry a second wife for himself? Or should you use the money for his son to get his first wife? After this lecture, let's go out over beer and you will see how difficult it is as a decision. And you will see, and you will see how this has been globalized in the literature. And they will say, women work in Africa more than men. It is a demographic ratio disturbed by the Atlantic slave trade. But where you see women doing men's work, Calabar, Benin, Cameroon, that was the zone where they took over two million slaves. And society responded by doing demographic shift in relation to labor. That's what they did. You, you have a current Eritrea is saying, go marry more wives. It was the Obama administration that told them, don't pass that bill. We do not study how the Atlantic slave trade destroyed populations and demographic imbalance. And people have to respond. And you now turn those responses into what you call tradition. Uh, and you make careless statements out of that. Coloniality of nature, two quick points. The, de the deritualization of spaces in which ritual spaces became secularized. I don't have time to explain that. And the linkage between environment and people. Go and study black African settlement patterns. They did not disconnect themselves from the environment. The environment where they settle will provide food, it will provide water, it will provide medicine. The plants and the people created a symbiotic relationship. When I was growing up in the 50s, ourselves and animals, we did not separate both of us. We didn't separate us. Your chickens and goats are at the back of your house. And you must not kill them for stupid reasons. Who are basically vegetarians. <laughs> because you need a reason to slaughter your goat. Now the animal, you use them to decorate your house. The crocodile skin is now your decoration so that the symbiotic relationship with the city, the villages, the environment, the animals, they were organic. We began to destroy them and damage them. Let me now leave you with 10 points. If you have not been listening to me, that's good, I forgive you. But whenever you give a lecture, you must ask yourself, what is the takeaway? What did I gain from coming here? I want to give you 10 gifts. And I will go quickly. I want to leave you with 10 takeaway. First, you must engage in epistemic rebellion. The last panel, that's what they did, epistemic rebellion. Second, you must engage in what I call liberatory intransigence. I don't know whether the translator can get it the intransigence of liberation. It is not something you just do once a month. Intransigence is like that root teenager who is trying to assert himself or assert, assert herself. Third, revolutionary, revolutionary self-assertion. They've been doing it since the 19th century. Pierre Vajay, we worked together at IFE. I was there when he was collecting many of his materials with great people, Labi and many others. That self-assertion is critical in which 
we were building self in relation to knowledge and using that knowledge to promote ourselves. We were saying we will not reject knowledge and scholarship from anywhere, but we turn it into the opportunity of self-assertion. That's the works of Nascimento, the Kulimble, the Iliaye people. That's basically what they are doing. Self-assertion. Fourth takeaway, combative identity nationalism. In the panel, the first panel this morning with the women introducing themselves, introducing their mission, introducing their indigeneity, they were doing combative identity nationalism. Point number five, criminalization of black stereotypes. So there are so many stereotypes on you, on me, but we do not criminalize those stereotypes. Other communities have criminalized the stereotypes. You can't abuse and say bad things about Jewish people. You will get into trouble if they say you are anti-Semitic. They've criminalized that stereotype on them. We have to begin to do that. Not allowing you, not allowing people to get away insulting, abusing, raping, marginalized people. We have to turn them into laws, into regulations. We have to take them into congresses and say, you can't say this. You can't do that. You can't say this. They criminalize, for instance, the use of nigger. There are many things we have to turn into legislation to say we are not going to accept. We have to do what I call disruptive humanitarianism. I do not know whether the translator will get it. If somebody is bringing goods to you, if somebody is bringing goods to you, you have to say, okay, what is the value of the goods you are giving me? Why are you giving me rice? In one of Usman Simbani's movie, Giliwa, why are you donating rice to Senegal? You are destroying my rice, and you are giving me rice. In that humanitarianism, we disrupt it. The Yoruba, they have a proverb. Anyone who can endure hunger will never witness humiliation. We must have the capacity to endure hunger, to endure suffering, instead of accepting humanitarianism that compels us to be undermined by hegemonic forces. We did it before, the endurance of hunger. And we must question all forms of humanitarian project. Is this good for my community? What does it do if you give me something that will end up destroying other things? And we have to evaluate and weigh and say, let us suffer rather than taking this. Four more points. Radical decolonization to seek epistemic freedom. That epistemic freedom is not negotiable. Today, the good news is that to those who are producing new PhDs, they don't have the problems I had in my generation when my papers were being graded in, the, in London, when I had to do GC, advanced level, University of London. Today, you now have a large number of professors like me. I've trained over 100 PhDs. And I, I can accept what they want to present. In my days, it was very difficult. Today, seeking that epistemic freedom has become easier for younger people because they can say, I don't want to work with this person. This is the professor I want to work with. And we have accepted that the idea of mainstream, when it doesn't suit us, we are not going to take. 
I edit eight monograph series. I have a series with Rutledge, with Pargrave. I have a series with University of Cambridge Press, with Rochester, with Carolina Academy Press. I have a series on black creativity with Bloomsbury, one of the biggest publishing houses in the world. And nobody can say they've rejected my manuscript because they don't like what I'm saying. No, you now have professors who can help you to publish what you are saying in the process of seeking this epistemic freedom. If you have a manuscript that people have rejected because you want to assert your freedom, do please contact me. We have to retain epistemic identity and we have to fight ecological atrocities and violence. No compromise. And finally, we must reconstruct our communities. In reconstructing our communities, we have to invest it with the power of identity. It will be well with you. It will be well with you. Thank you. Good evening. Now I yield the floor to Rochi Curiel. She's Dominican. She's a theoretician, um, feminist militant, Latin American, Caribbean, uh, anti racist, decolonial, and lesbian. Okay? <laughs> and more. So, okay, she said this in the backstage. Okay, please. You can say that I'm a teacher. She said to me that I'm a professor in the University of Columbia. You cannot forget to say that I'm a les that I'm a lesbian like, activist. <laughs> Please, I'll be mad. <laughs> professor Uch launched a book on her PhD thesis today, the denationalization, the Haitian denationalization in the Dominican Constitutional Court. She has a classic, we can say it's a classic, The Heterosexual Nation, about the Colombian uh, Constitution Assembly. She has a, a book with the, the Diego Falcone about feminism, the colonial feminism. And now I yield the floor to Professor Pochi Curiel. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, already. Um, well, uh, first of all, I say I'm speaking Portuguese, Portuguese, Spanish, and all possibilities of being able to communicate with you. Um, I would like to thank you for the invitation. Um, I'd like to thank the, all your attitude the, the, of the team, the organization of the event. It's very beautiful. Uh, very, all very prompt to help us. Um, and today, Saturday, we're, you're here. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, very long. I think we can dialogue. Uh, because in addition to this, I, I, want to, I want to drink beer and then samba. So I think that's the most decolonial we can do. So... Uh, um, so I'm going to refer to the question in this dialogue, which is how can we, what can we do, what actions and projects we have to uh, come fight epistemicide, epistemicide, genocide, and ethnocide? How am I going? How are we going to do this? First thing I want to say is that in this moment of my life, I'm a decolonial feminist, and I'd like to say that. Um, I'm recovering our own stories from the critical currents of feminism, which I'm a part of. Black feminism, uh, le feminist lesbianism, anti-Nazi, anti-capitalist, because everyone has that. What is a decolonial feminist? It's not a single concept. It's a political bad, a political option that recovers our own proposals. Uh, obviously, we re 
recognize the concept of uh, the colonial feminism of Maria Lugones, which is, is a meeting with Maria Lugones that we were able to formulate that. The other thing that I want to say is that I'm not uh, an academic because academic is have a capitalistic production, uh, is privatized of knowledge. What I write, what I do, is part of a collective construction by many people uh, of, of which we are a part in the political current. And it's something that I take with me in academia and university is knowledge that we make together. So this wave of uh, professors uh, and academics has nothing to do with me. And the other thing is that the colonial feminism is a uh, political practice. Uh, one thing that happens now is that the concepts of the coloniality, coloniality, um, there is a fad, and the fad has to do uh, with how the system takes the most critical thinking and radical thinking to make this thing that uh, I, I um, I mean, like grabbing concepts, um, swallowing concepts and, and categories. But I think that most of them don't have a collective political practice. And for me, this is colonial. So I think that the, the question that you do here uh, the way we, how can we build it collectively has to do with another question uh, that what is the world that I want to build? This question that could be very simple for me is the most difficult one. So to many, many social movements in which they have people who have political practice a type of policy is the the acknowledgement of its city, its state, academia, etc. And I think most social movements have this policy. However, they have a series of policies starting from identity. So a lot of social movements have the priority of uh, being a black movement, an indigenous movement, a uh, lesbian movement, LGBTQ, etc. Uh, another thing that I've learned uh, throughout this history is that this, poli this identitary policy has brought us to uh, separatism. The separatism for me, I've been separatist. I always say that I've been separatist for a long time. I've been separatist uh, uh, re regarding white uh, feminists as an African American, uh, as a lesbian regarding heterosexuals, and so it goes. But and then I was I matured in activism, and and the thing that the white feminist said about separatism was a, a political mistake. And what do I mean by that? I'll speak Spanish slowly. I'll try to explain more clearly. This uh, identitary politics, uh, this black identities, indigenous lesbians, uh, are the result of uh, the ways in which uh, the colonialism has defined us. Uh, that is, being Black was a colonial category that obviously uh, all of us give a, a, a different meaning and take as something positive in the experience. Being lesbian was uh, a product of the psychological and psychiatric logic that has defined us in a Western logic. Same for indigenous people. So what is the question that we have underlying of this, that identities are precisely the differences 
that have constructed the colonial logic for the specific groups in the inferiorization logic. So, okay, do you understand me? Okay, so I'm not saying that the identitary policy has to, we have to reject it like, like post-structuralism has proposed because it post-structuralism was created by white men that were very clear about their identity, what inside whiteness. So what I'm saying is the identity policy cannot be nowadays our end in our political project, but it, it could be only a strategy and why. And I would like to resume uh, the cycles that actor uh, our uh, companion said this morning. So world today, there's a series of social phenomena that are structural, uh, systemic, and they're continuous. So if we see uh, um, the multinationals that got into the national territory and it's only growing, uh, the racist, sexist violence started with colonialism and still there, every, everything that means financial capital that articulates uh, financial geopolitics takes us, our people to extreme poverty. That's impressive. And with the pandemic in 2019, got, after 2019 got very much more difficult. But part of this moment, uh, it's the multicultural liberal logic that in which the the nations now to recognize the indigenous and black people, including uh, constitutionally, are uh, calling themselves multicultural, pluricultural, multinational, and it's even was part of the priority, political priority of the social movements. So, so I want to build the world like uh, we have learned in black feminism and we have completed with uh, the colonial feminism that ends up with all oppression, race, sex, geopolitic, nationalism, class, and what world do I want to build with whom? That implicates uh, multiple subjects and necessarily has to have a liberation project with emancipation, liberation, whatever, you, however you name it. So a project that necessarily has to end all kinds of oppression at the same time. I don't believe in this uh, white feminism thing that always talked about women universally. I don't believe in the feminism that only only puts as its main topic violence against women. I don't believe in the black movement that only talks about anti-racism or identity policy, black identity policy. I don't believe anymore in an indigenous movement that doesn't put the heterosexism or races in as a priority. That means that social movements, uh, my main interest is uh, collective policy. We cannot keep having, being complicitous with the state nation. The state is the, the legal institution of coloniality. So everyone says, oh, it's very hard to leave the state. So the state to, it takes us to a question that is polit politics. A lot of people think that politics is fundamentally uh, around the state, but our people have always historically, ancestrally, have always made policy politics. 
with a power logic. The colonial feminism, the one I, I'm pointing to, needs a, a, a point to me that is key. It's autonomy. And autonomy has to be uh, in relation to the state. That is, that doesn't mean that we need to, to dispute, for example, what happened here in the elections, Bolsonaro, Lula, these are critical moments. What happened in Colombia now to uh, end up Uribism, but it's a dispute moment. You know, not even Francia Marquez nor Lula are going to uh, transform, make a decolonial transformation. They can make reforms, changes, but coloniality is structural and no government is going to be able to make it. And this also happens in academia. What are we going to do with academia? Demia is, uh, is, an institu is the institution of the coloniality of knowledge. So now, are we going to deny it, academia? No, and yes, no in the following sense. Because I think that also people who don't historically don't have the right of getting into these institutions, it's important to have a dispute there. It's important to take uh, knowledge, critical knowledge, the colonial knowledge to the academia. But at the same time, and in parallel to that, we have to uh, create processes of political education outside the academia. It's a political education process that we need collectively in the social movements. Because you know what academia is. A professor can have a lot of good intentions, but the structure of the academia, especially now with privatization, more and more demands the privatization of knowledge. So also another point that I think is key is the other ways of making politics um, art, spoken word, ancestrality, spirituality, are ways uh, the, our companion talk about that, epistemological forms in our lives. The whole time we're doing that, the whole time in our people, in our communities, we are doing epistemology. How are we going to recognize uh, how a knowledge, uh, as, a, as a valid knowledge, that is able to make it to the syllabus of our papers in English, for example. Then also, the other point within uh, coloniality of knowledge, I talk about that when I presented the book today, is how change of the most of the, the, the experts in social sciences and humanities. So my proposal is that we have to study the elites, how the elites behave, what is their discourse, what are their practices, and we need more tools for our political fight. And also another point to fight not only racism, uh, but also to uh, widen the question a little bit, I'm not able to fight a fi an anti-racist fight without an anti-sexist, anti-atrocistic, anti-classist, anti-all um, oppression matrix. Uh, something we have to have is uh, anti-nationalist position that would, what well, would it seem uh, in a speech level? I think um, in football, for example, we are nationalists. And how are we going to do this? What is the, our position, our emotional position, and also political uh, and nationalism? And, um, and this fight against nationalism necessarily, doesn't necessarily has, ha, have to put it in the place of articulating with other people. 
I don't know if you know, but IT, our first uh, of dignity in this moment, is going through a humanitarian crisis, an impressive crisis. There are almost no uh, Brazilian humanitarian movements um, that have a articulation uh, proposal there. The Black movement uh, ha has an example uh, of IET with the dignity of the Black people beyond other nations. So what is the responsibility we have over that? And the other has to do with the proposal that implicates about academia that we are giving to academia and about legitimate, but it's not enough. We need to work seriously about all of this that we're talking, you know, in terms of self-representation and all of that. How can these, this research uh, do that? And not only to satisfy uh, an academic requirement, you know, that leads us again to legitimize the academy. So for me, to face the epistemicidal logics, uh, the genocidal logics that implies in taking a stand and taking a stand uh, requires understanding the complexity of this world in this historical moment, which is nothing more than an extension of what already began with colonialism that has new faces now. I'd like to leave this uh, here so that we can open up the dialogue. Thank you. I want to learn to arrive here with a small piece of paper and be able to say all of that. But anyway, I, I will make a few considerations and then I'll pass the floor to the uh, audience so that we can try to make a few points. When Professor Falula mentioned... Oops, hang on of the control epistemology, I remembered uh, the discussion about the anthropology of domination that is very evident in this matter when she works with the matter of the nation state and Professor Falula also talked about that. I think that a word that can define both talks in different ways is indisciplinary because uh, they started talking about disciplines and this indiscipline, both in social movements and in the academy itself. So I think that was very clear for both uh, talks. And a notion of the connection of the communities, both in Oti's uh, talk and also uh, Professor Falula's talk, uh, that notion that uh, Rita Voltanes talks about a vincularity, the, the attachments, uh, the ties, and uh, what that uh, has collected. Uh, relationship with uh, what they show. And it seems to me that it's very clear in your talk about these interlocutions of, again, uh, recovering the Haiti discussion and showing this need, uh, for lack of a better word, of internationalism. But it's not an internationalism. It's the discussion of uh, historical projects for peoples regardless of the nations. That I, I mentioned another point here, and from Oti, uh, well, she talked about autonomy. Autonomy is very dear to you too, right? Because of the discussion of uh, feminism, autonomistic uh, feminism, originally, and co coalition. I think I mentioned that the university. I think uh, for the questions, it would be very nice. Maybe Oti can. Uh, talk about this further, we can have a round of questions. You know, uh, the methodology issue, which is something that I think is okay to talk about, since uh, it seems like the word for both talks was this indisciplinary, and you incidentally mentioned uh, the study of the elites, and in the talk of the launch of the book, uh, you th talked about thinking about other methodologies, because it, when we talk about methodologies, we're still strictly colonial. We are critical until we get to this methodology uh, part. So I 
ba basically that's what I thought. Uh, something else will come to me later on, and I have difficulty to understand my own handwriting, but anyway. So I now pass uh, the floor to the audience. And Ochi, you still owe me uh, the answer about the methodology question. Would you like to get uh, the microphone, please? Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Hi. Better now? Well, good evening to everyone. I'd like to congratulate the panel and the meeting in general terms. It's a fantastic meeting. I was in a philosophy meeting uh, from Ampof a month ago, and there were 48 groups, and two spoke of racial matters. So I think this is a time of how much our university is Eurocentric and, you know, the Ampof national meeting. In the Institute, oh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Wallace de Moraes. I'm a professor from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and I'm here very happy to look at this panel. I'm a fan of Ochi Aguareal, and uh, it's wonderful to listen to you, and it's wonderful to listen to uh, Mr. Falula as well, but also wonderful to hear you. And uh, in the Institute uh, where I teach, there are 78 professors, two black actually three black professors. And the first black woman joined uh, the university staff now, I think three months ago. And by chance, I was uh, presiding, was the chair of, of uh, the committee who decided, and there was no favoritism. I just mentioned that it was, it was the first uh, black women of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So in our population in Brazil is majority uh, black and the electoral uh, election campaign, I think all of us must remember it seemed that if uh, there were no black candidates and most of the population has 52% of black people in Brazil. So I think it's an institutional sign of racism. So there were two black candidates and uh, the other two did not even show in the electoral uh, debates. So to listen to you, Ochi, uh, I mean, the question is for you, I think, uh, when you criticize and you understand that we must break uh, all of these uh, social oppressions. It's beautiful to listen. You uh, step beyond the identities. I, I think you need to be very brave to say that today in any place and in Brazil as well. That's why I congratulate you for that, for doing that. And, uh, you know, I think the struggles must be connected and one must help another. Uh, you know, the black people need to re acknowledge uh, the f fight of the indigenous popu uh, populations and uh, and other people, you know, they uh, must uh, acknowledge also the LGBTQIA plus uh, fight as well. So, first of all, I noticed that you criticized, and it was very nice. Again, I, I see that it goes beyond the state itself. So, I think you need to understand that the state is a colonialist institution. It was the state who enslaved our uh, predecessors. It was the modern European state that sequestered and kidnapped Africans and brought them here to the Americas to produce riches and wealth under uh, a slavery regime. So it was the state that institutionally imposed all of the colonial uh, issues. So the state, I called uh, it a churchism. Uh, the state did that in agreement with the church be because they understood that black people and indigenous people were inferior and they did not have uh, a capacity to occupy their own states. So the state is chauvinistic. The state is patriarchal. Historically, it was born that way. That's why I enjoyed seeing that it goes beyond that. You know, it's more than that. So the strengthening of the social struggles, this uh, strengthening so that we don't have the illusion that it's going to happen this, this and that because of uh, go governor A, B or C, because not necessarily the government and for sure, because, you know, uh, governments, uh, governments have governed before and they have never uh, ended patriarchy and racism and all of these uh, social oppression forms. So it's very nice to listen to you. And just to complete your criticism to nationalism is uh, preponderant. It's uh, um, there, because we need to bring this to the academy. This academy is white. It's white. In Rio, 
uh, where most of the population is black, the academy is white. And here in Florianopolis, I mean, uh, most uh, people are white. I don't even know if there are any black people in the universities, and this is absurd. But I think it's a bit of what I want to say. And in this sense, I'd like to, I, I'd like you please to talk about this relationship again, just for us to go deeper into nationalism in the state and all of the forms of oppression. And once again, I'd like to thank you so much for being here and listening to you. I think it's a challenge, and I'd like to also congratulate everyone here. You know, because in a state in which uh, the right wing won uh, by far, uh, not only in the state, but in in the entire uh, so southern region to have a conference like this. It's very significant. I think uh, there's uh, Aya, right? Is that the name? Aya, which is the lab that's organizing all of this. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you. So, so thank you very much. Wallace, 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 my name. I'm Wallace. My name is Wallace. My name is Kizua. I am from Angola. I live in Rio Grande do Sul, a state in the south of Brazil. And my question is for Professor, uh, you know, how uh, we Africans in the diaspora, especially, how are we going to reclaim who we are, our, our culture and our ancestry uh, and our, but our parents who are in Africa, they don't even speak our languages. Sometimes I only speak the language of the oppressor. I speak Portuguese and I only speak Portuguese. So how can we, from the outside, can rebuild and reclaim? Because, you know, I have something that is from the black culture. I work with rap. But uh, if you look at me as I'm dressing, I'm dressing like an American. So this is something. How, how can we reclaim all of that? And also, I link that to what Professor uh, uh, Ochi mentioned. Um, in terms of the fight that we need to have uh, to remove all types of oppression, because that are, there are issues that we see many times with the African culture. A lot of Africans here in Brazil, Hugo and in many other places, they're seen as chauvinistic uh, against uh, the gay people and the lesbians. And so in what critical moment in this soft line that divides, uh, what is an attitude that is aggressive and intolerant of a cultural matter, and a professor once told me that this is ethnocentrism uh, for us to look at other outlooks because what may be wrong in the construction of that place is right and vice versa. And my question is this one. I believe that's very beautiful. Uh, I believe that very much, uh, that if we uh, that we should destroy, destroy all types of oppression. But in practice, I think it's very hard to do that precisely because of this deconstruction of what is the culture of a place and to think that you're going to destroy ethnocentrism because if it is to destroy all types of oppression, I believe that we w wouldn't have this vision of what's right and what's wrong. Everyone would have to him or herself. It would be a bet in life. Everything is allowed. But uh, the individual should decide what uh, is suitable for them. Thank you very much. That's the question that I'd like to ask. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for being here with us. I am very proud when I see a representative that's very important from people who came to Brazil enslaved 500 years ago and of which I'm a part as a descendant uh, of this Yoruba ancestry coming to 100 years ago to Brazil enslaved, like the diaspora itself that uh, happened. The decolonization issue and the colonization itself, regrettably, it lasts, it, it lasts until today because I live and I was born in a country called Rio Grande do Sul, the southernmost state of Brazil. And this country, no, not country, state, the state within Brazil is considered to be the most racist state of Brazil. It's a contingent of 61% of Italian and German descent and ethnicity. 
and those who came here at the time of slavery was to develop and fix the territory to the immigrants who arrived from Europe and they were paid by the Brazilian government. They would paid by their governments and they uh, were these immigrants. So that's how the story goes. And um, our story uh, is told of this ship's uh, a legitimate uh, genocide, a true genocide that killed many who came here and the bestiality still exists. For uh, two or four million and more than a hundred million of enslaved peoples removed from Africa. So the issue, in my view, is still difficult um, for us to end racism. Racism, what, what I'm very much concerned with is that racism until today, the 21st century, is stronger and stronger in view of, uh, for the youth, especially in the academia. Uh, and I'm saying the academia, the universities, because I am not from uh, the academia, as uh, uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Ochi from Colombia's hand. I, I have a brute word. I, I only studied uh, uh, elementary school and incomplete. But uh, f for five years now, I'm uh, working in partnership with the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And I, am, I, I see racism almost every day in the university uh, students themselves. Here we have an African, if you allow me, if I may. This is, uh, you know, he said that no, and I understand and I respect it, but racism uh, lasts until today in, in the social part. And we cannot understand uh, if racism, uh, it comes from the womb, it comes from uh, childhood and it's hereditary. It's, it's strong racism, very strong racism in Uganda. So uh, I'm, I'm not here to talk about racism in Santa Catarina, but Santa Catarina is also part of the national territory. Only those who live here know that racism lasts also uh, in uh, Santa Catarina as well. So racism, racism is regrettably because of melanin, because what I have inside, my soul, my spirit, my blood is just the same as any other ethnicity. What's going to change is thoughts and ideologies. What's going to change is a term that's always said, the indifferent. Indifferent is the different. He's not wrong. And to many, he's all, also not right, but he's just indifferent. So uh, when we say here in Brazil that we are indifferent, uh, here we are, because uh, in the month of November, to talk about uh, the date that we have for Black Awareness Day in Brazil, on November the 20th, I can be arrogant. I've, I've told, I've, I've given 10 lectures to beat and beat and beat on this intolerance and beat and beat and beat on the teachings. And now decolonization and uh, that my fathers and, and grandfathers were beat up by these racist people from Rio Grande do Sul. And uh, the ones who know it all, the rich and mil the millionaires, but those who made everything that they have uh, to be rich was our ethnicity by means of beatings and by means of uh, farms and by means of the industries and by means of cleaning the, uh, the fields to uh, have the plantations, colonial plantations, uh, those who did that were our ethnicity. So it's hard. It's hard because it is hard to understand certain ethnicities for them to understand that we are superior to them. Why are we superior to them? Because we are not stupid. If we were stupid, as they think, with all due respect, 
for uh, uh, Mr. Falola and for uh, Ariel, I, uh, for the respect that I have uh, for uh, in language, I, I've learned a lot from you, Sapet Me, but I, uh, I teach Yoruba uh, language. So from here, who came enslaved from Africa, in my mind, uh, th that was not lost. This was not lost because I learned, I heard the elders, my ancestors, the ones who came before me, I heard them speak the language Yoruba and to talk about the Yoyo culture and where they lived, spoken language, all spoken language, and one told to the other until it came to me. So I say, what is there is just that it's together with looking at my melanin, my pigment, is to look at this moment of this month, is the cultural diversity that Africa has and the cultural diversity that we have in Brazil. If you look closer, our culture, the ones from our universities, it's not just to learn how to kill, how to shoot, it's not bombs, and it's not powder, gunpowder. The African knows, and I uh, i don't know, uh, it is to love and respect the others, and that's not happening. You have persecutions uh, in Brazil because of the new Pentecostal church in a way that is absurd. It has such a big power. And of this that I see, they, they are the ones who do not have a soul. They are the ones who do not have a spirit or awareness. And so I say, with all due respect to those who follow, a paper accepts everything. But many times out of these papers, because I know who they are, because everybody knows who uh, where those papers are, you have a Bible and it is controversial it's false and a liar and it makes up what we what we're not thank you once again for your presence thank you two more people max because we have uh, time for the lecturers to answer i'll be brief for us to close i'd like to thank professor ochi and professor toing for the words when we think about this setup. I was talking to Professor Ochi before, and this dialogue was in the sense of how, uh, based on different locus, different spaces, uh, geopolitical spaces, we can build a dialogue and learn. And I was asking myself, and for sure, we don't have time to answer all of that, but I'd also like to leave this question here because I was asking uh, myself, Professor Ochi said that it's necessary to break with this nation, uh, nation state because it, it is colonial within this uh, co uh, configuration of modernity. Professor Falola comment commented that it's necessary to build a nationalism that is identitary, this idea of nation. Are we talking about the same meaning of nation? And here, I think, is it the same meaning? Is it the national state in the setup that's European? You know, it's just a question for us to think about. And after we go and have a beer, we can talk about it as well, because if we don't have so much time here, so thank you. Anybody else? One more question then. One more question and... Okay. Two more? Oh, okay. If there are two, we can do two. Good evening. My name is Priscila. I am a professor, basic education in Sao Paulo. I'd like to ask a question to uh, Professor Falola, but feel free to uh, say anything if you also want to, uh, Ms. Ochi. After a, a few things that I've been thinking about uh, in the classroom, regarding education, I think that the great issue of uh, the ethno-racial issues of the quotas in the university is that when we go into these spaces, we don't live, leave our epistem, our cosmovision at the door of the university. This epistem, our epistem, uh, displaces Eurocentric weights and measures. In the words of Shimamanda, she says that there's a balance of stories and uh, you talked about the universities of this new 
knowledge in Brazil, we had uh, uh, we, we went back to the ones doing labors, especially uh, in the North region. My uh, children came uh, into the world by means of these uh, women, uh, the midwives, and uh, thinking about the university and uh, new epistemic knowledges, uh, other epistemic knowledges. As a professor, I'm very much concerned with uh, Western schooling. This schooling is responsible for introducing a monoculture, a human monoculture. Basically, the same program is being taught in the world, uh, and the same science and the same geography. And basically, nobody questions the intention of this program, of this schooling. The plan is to put every child in school with the justification of these communities need to uh, be developed. I'd like you uh, uh, talk a little bit about that. <laughs> There was one more question, and then we can go and uh, start to answer them. Boa noite, professor. Boa noite, professora. Eu me chamo Pedro, e na fala de vocês, eu fiquei refletindo muito, porque vocês tocam num ponto de uma crítica que envolve, que envolve para mim um conceito de conto professor, que é uma noção de paz, é o conceito de paz, de pacificação, que... Quando a professora fala do Estado Nacional, o professor fala da, da indisciplinaridade, envolve essa ideia de que o diferente, o confronto, o conflito, o debate, ele muitas das vezes é encarado na escola como um problema. Que a gente, o aluno ideal, o professor ideal é aquele que tem uma sala de aula sem conflito, sem uma discordância. Uma ideia de. Do you professor is a... It's, the idea of it is sold for us to think that the state is it's, it's eternally six, uh, a situation of peace, uh, pacified society. That's nothing more than the hegemonic thinking. I think in Brazil, uh, this consensus that there is a universal model that must be followed and period. Anything beyond that is uh, rebellion, so has to be pacified. I come from the state of Rio de Janeiro, where the big security project uh, the last years were the OPP, the Pacifying Police Unit, the idea that favela should uh, take the form that the state, the favela should behave the way the state should be. And that involved cultural practices as well, as a teacher, I had an um, almost daily confrontation with this idea of facing this uh, state policification. Um, that we try to seek uh, understanding by difference that is not the non existence of dispute. This dispute is normal. I always remember Krenaki saying that uh, in Brazil pre. Uh, the arrival of Europeans, uh, there are always disputes. Uh, there's not an idyllic world. But these disputes are part of the internal dynamics and not necessarily had to be pacified by uh, a superior. When we talk about uh, overcome this vision of uh, the state nation, um, that we had to um, go further than pacification um, and have our own dynamics. So I'd like to know if you believe that, how to believe that this could be possible uh, through, especially as a professor in school, that, because as a teacher, it's, uh, I, people always uh, demand from me this, this position as a pacifier to pacify my classroom. Good evening, so okay, I'll yield the, the time to the floor. And what the colleague commented is a paradox, because we have a huge degree of violence, and we spend the whole time talking about pacifying. Uh, we talk about there's no apartheid in the country, or there, that there's never been, and Black people aren't able to cross the square and get to the government palace. 
in the islands, it was called uh, Desterro. And um, okay, I'll, I'll pass to Oji. And okay, you pass to Mr. Falola. Thank you very much. From the questions, the long comments, and the um, uh, desire to ask more questions, it's clear that this has been a very successful panel and that you're able to connect with what we are saying. I enjoy the disagreements because where there are no disagreements, people, knowledge cannot move forward. Um, we can, the idea in a conference like this is not to manufacture consent. Uh, the title of a popular book by Chomsky, uh, but to do multiple reflections through various angles. So I'm very grateful. Um, I'm not going to respond to all the comments. The young man from um, uh, Kisula from Angola, I think, the, you are right on the issue of um, the disconnect between the contemporary generation of Africans in diaspora and those at, at home with their cultures. It's not an African phenomenon. Uh, it's a global phenomenon. Uh, all of their people, this, they complain about the same thing. Uh, so the banana tree, the mother banana, has revealed to us how these things work. When the mother banana dies, before it dies, it reproduces many baby bananas. And the babies grow in different ways, some tall, some crooked, some bent. We are all going to have that. What is important is also to have those who have been represented at this conference who understand what is going on and try to work towards connection. I do a lot of work for the African Union and what we have done historically, Africa used to be divided into five regions. But now we've created the sixth region, the African diaspora. And we are integrating both of them uh, in terms of uh, fusing knowledge together, meeting at Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to look at commonalities developing a wide range of interactions, promoting cultures, is not going to be enough. But to those who are interested in, in what you call reclaiming, the Reclaim Project, they have an opportunity to be part of it. Your point about the disconnect between fresh new African immigrants in Brazil and the established ones, you find the same thing in the US. Some, it's even worse in the US, that disconnect between contemporary African immigrants. There have been three waves of um, black people in the diaspora. The, the best known and the established one Afro-Brazilians, African-Americans, uh, those who are funneled by the Atlantic slave trade, th those are the best known. But there are two other waves, the waves of the diaspora of colonization. During, when Europeans were controlling Africa, a number of Africans came to the US and other places seeking opportunities. One prominent one, was the former president of the US, Barack Obama, is that came from Kenya to study. And the current vice president, Kamara, the father is a distinguished economist who came from Jamaica. So there's that diaspora. 
and there's a diaspora of Bretton Wood institutions. The devastating consequences made by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, when currencies were devalued. That produced my own wave, the wave of the 80s, in which intellectuals left Mexico, left Brazil, left Africa, and began to look for opportunities. Today, I study that. I study contemporary African immigrants. It's now over two million. The very thing that the young man said you find in the US, and you must understand it, it's, it's, it's not very complicated. The generation that came after ages, they came to benefit from the struggles of their predecessors. They're benefiting from the civil rights movement, but they did not take part in the civil rights. So they did not appreciate the struggles that preceded them. That's a fault in the education system in Africa, and it's also the fault in the education system in Europe and in the US. Some people, if you say who is Martin Luther King, you'll be surprised they don't know. So you and I have a lot of work to do. That what you are enjoying now as an immigrant is made possible by your people who suffered for you. People who suffered, who did not even live in lo long enough to benefit from their struggles. And you hold them not just respect for the continuity of their struggles. Nations, states, and things like that. We, as she said, we'll talk more because we can create nations outside of the concept of the former states. Mas Weber became famous for introducing that idea of the formal and informal realms. You, the informal realms of power, of authority, have become so extensive now. They're so extensive that the opportunities to work outside of the frame of the state is far more extensive than what people can imagine. People who study Somali in Minnesota, Somali in Ohio, the Yoruba in Baltimore. I'm the patron of the Yoruba Association in Austin. There are now alternative communities organizing credit, organizing help, organizing venture capitalism, organizing their own banking system, organizing cultural reproduction. I have a license to, to let people get married. I, I, I can have a license, not, it doesn't extend to Brazil. If you are gays and your parents say they don't want you to do something, I have a license to marry you. <laughs> and, and, and there are these opportunities. She can obtain a license to marry people. You can obtain a license. There, there, there are multiple opportunities now. And our predecessors, Nago communities by here, plantations, they created families. They did. I, I, I serve on peace missions. I run diplomatic errands. I have traveled in the Sahel in West Africa, Mali, Burkina Faso. They've created communities outside of the state, organizing their own food supply system, their own banking, their own trade. There's a documentary, traders from Mali to Lagos. So this, these opportunities now exist. Uh, and as to universities, I hope many of you are aware that you can now create your own university. I hope you are aware of that. I have friends in California, I have friends in Africa who now create their own universities. And they're very legitimate institutions. They're extremely legitimate. Uh, opportunities that were not there uh, when, when I was growing up. As this is my last opportunity to talk, not in live, on this panel, because I'm still going to talk. I want to do what elders do. We talk in allegories. We usually, when you come to me, I tell you a story. And your business is to understand the story. One panel in the morning was yesterday was talking about how the grandmother was telling stories. 
And I want to borrow a story from Facing Mount Kenya. And the story, as many stories in Africa, West Indies, we use the animals to represent human beings. The coyote, the spider, the tortoise, where I come from. And this story was set in the forest. Many villages are set in the forest. I, I'm a storyteller, I write stories myself and I do poetry. And I've said many stories in the jungle. So the animals were very envious of human beings. When it was raining, the rain would not fall on them. Son, you and I would go into the house. And the animals were saying, why are they living in caves and on top of trees? And they are victims of mosquitoes. Rain is biting, beating them. Sun is beating them. Why can't they build their own houses? Yes, Fox said, I'm going to start. And Fox built a house, nice house. And he did what human beings did. He called a housewarming party. When it's time for them to leave, the tiger refused to go. The tiger said, Fox, you build this house for me. On the count of three, if you don't leave, I'm going to eat you. Because you know the family of the cat. <laughs> they kill one another. They can fight. The fox said, look, I am not going to be able to fight the tiger. And he left. Back to the jungle, beaten by rain. And decided to build another house. Made a mistake, which you all do. Housewarming party with your cheese and wine. Bringing jealous people to your house. And the lion said, this house belongs to me. The fox lost the second house. And I said, it's going to build the largest one. The largest. Now he said, let me imitate the king of, the, of, of human beings who built a palace. And he built a palace. It's so big, the elephant will enter. The elephant said, ah, this is my house. Unknown to them, the fox realized they are going to steal the house away from him. So he already set up combustibles and gasoline. And when the elephant said, I'm going to steal this, take this house away from you, fox set up set the house on fire. And the moral of the story, there's not going to be peace, there's not going to be justice until you set the house on fire. Thank you very much. Bueno, um, ¿cómo hacer para well, how to fight against all oppressions at the same time? I think that it's a political decision. It's very easy. Well, it's not easy, actually, but it's easier to think about a revolutionary project, an emancipation project, being anti-racist, but not anti-sexist or heterosexist, because that implies that many people have privileges and they uh, end up using these privileges. For example, the Latin American left wing is extremely sexist and heterosexist because it's still thinking that the social class determines the relationships. And it's also very much racist because it does not have a reading of the articulation of what capitalism means with the exploitation of racialized black popular uh, indigenous labor. So I think that it's uh, making a decision and making a stand. It's easier 
for us to stay inside our niches, our identity groups, instead of making a political proposition and to act as a consequence on how we're going to face the oppressions at the same time. This means that we also need to work on ourselves, work on our privileges within the social relations that we have, either because I am heterosexual, either because I'm white, either because I'm, I don't know, North American in terms of nationality. So this is, this is not easy. It's the hardest part of coloniality. If you understand coloniality as this uh, power matrix that set up the hierarchies of race and class and heterosexuality, nationality, then you have to act as a consequence of that. that. You can't only finish a private uh, fight because in addition, all of the violent systems have an origin that, you know, everything happens at the same time. We can fragment methodologically a research. But the reality is not this one. The reality is complexity. So how are we going to do that? This implies taking a stand. And it also implies on white people, for example, that, you know, where are they going to put their privileges? The white people from these universities, what is the place of these privileges? To study col coloniality, it's not just to learn what Quijano said and what Maria Lacone said and Miolo, even at the Ochecurie. Coloniality is a power matrix that it's still there all the time and even worse. If you want to talk about internal colonialism, that too. This on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, the other thing is that I think, I believe actually, that the concept of nation, not only as an epistemological uh, category, but as a historical reality, was born in Europe. And after that, the republics came about, they copied the Creole, no, you don't say Creole here, right? Whatever, the new elites, political elites, uh, uh, not just the countries, they copied the logic of nation of, from Europe. So this has a date, it has a historical moment. And so there are nationalisms that you could think maybe that they're legitimate in view of a metropolis. Hmm? But this idea of nation, that like Anderson said, uh, it's a community more than anything, it's, it's a myth. It's a myth because a nation is defined by those criteria that precisely the nationalists made, which, you know, the border, you separate from another person, from another person that in general, I think I think I'm uh, superior than the other person. I'm better than the other person. So I think any proposal needs to be anti-nationalistic. I think this is very important, at least to me, that's very important. To understand how this idea came about because the national states, they were born thanks to nationalism. It was the idea of nationalism that created the national states. So I think that if we are going to question the fundamental colonial institutions, we need to be internationalist in, of all sorts. And I think there are other questions. Oh, peace. I think that the concept of, concept of peace has a lot of meaning. For example, right now in Colombia, uh, there's an armed internal conflict for more than 60 years. It's very important to talk about peace. 
But peace is not to silence the guns. It implies on a redistribution of land, for example, which is the origin of uh, the armed conflict in Colombia. So now, for example, the new president, he talks about total peace. And total peace means a negation, a negotiation with all of the armed actors. And in addition to that, it's very important to talk about peace in Colombia because the war in Colombia is supported by the economic and political elites for a long time. In addition, uh, you know, uh, drug trafficking and the death politics of dispossession of multinationals, for example. But the right wing talks a lot about peace and pacification. You in Brazil, it, that's the best example uh, to uh, for that. And pacification is nothing more than a militarization. The murder of uh, black men, as we saw on the play in the favelas, in the slums, geographically, this space-time relation has to do with specific places, right? So what is pacification, uh, creation of peace? Uh, well, thinking about the right wing, it's fundamentally that militarization on the one hand and supposedly to eliminate, well, supposedly, right, quote, unquote, eliminate the conflict. I think that conflict are normal uh, in the society because we are full of power relations, including those that uh, call our, uh, ourselves colonial. Uh, so how are we going to have a different proposition different from militarization, from the state, from liberal justice, to confront social conflicts. This is a very complicated task. Right now, I don't believe in jails, for example, in prisons. I also don't believe militarization and the police being a military police. All of these are institutional elements from the state, because we, our people, our ancestral people, they had way to, uh, they uh, made way for other types of justice. So in school, uh, school is a lab of that, but not only school. School is one. But we, in our movements, in our collective movements, in our, in our uh, communities, we need to think or recover as well new ways of justice to talk about peace. Peace needs to be structural. There no, there's no peace if there's no uh, social justice. Thank you. Well, with Ochi's words, and remembering that even our national states, Portugal and Spain, they were made by expelling Jews and Moros and the Moors. So uh, there was a colonialism process, internal one, even in those national states in Europe, and it's a, 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 an erasement. You can see the Islamic diaspora in France and all of that. So with that, we uh, close our panel. Of course, that everyone is invited to meet at the Mujiu and drink some beer and cachaça. And from then on, whatever you want. And tomorrow at 9 a.m., we will restart our work in uh, on a Sunday. Thank you so much. Good evening.